Thank you very much. I think actually it was Stephen who was uh, the initiator of sending the students to the Hague. He called me uh, when he was in the throes of the Velocitas trial and asked if I had a student who might come and assist the defense. And I asked my students, and four of them volunteered. And I didn't know how to select them, and Stephen said, send all of them. And I think uh, three of them. Well, all four of them went and worked for you, didn't they, yeah. for about six yeah. months? Yeah. And then you hired some of them, and they started earning money. The first yeah. six months were pro bono. Um, and uh, so it was the beginning of a career for several students. Well, thank you, Stephen, for, for doing that. I have suggested as a, I don't have any PowerPoint, uh, I've suggested as a, a topic to discuss the history of crimes against humanity. and. Lest you think, lest you think this is just a sort of an intellectual digression, I, I want to initially just study a little bit on the importance for uh, contemporary advocacy in international criminal law of uh, an understanding and appreciation of the, the history of the concept of crimes against humanity. Uh, Stephen uh, discussed the, the debate going on now in the pretrial chamber about the scope of crimes against humanity. It relates in part to the construction of Article 7 of the Rome Statute, which is the definition that's being applied by the International Criminal Court. But it's also about the history of crimes against humanity, because in his uh, dissenting opinion, Judge Cowell of the pretrial chamber has referred to the history of the concept and said that we have to interpret the provisions of the Rome Statute, specifically this reference to state or organizational policy in light of what crimes against humanity was intended to mean in a historical sense. And he's quite clear about this in his opinions. And I, I spoke to him in The Hague last week. He was, he was um, having a little discussion with a New York Times journalist and telling her to pay attention to this because he said this was a decisive importance in the evolution of the, in fact, in the, in the activities of the International Criminal Tribunal, and particularly the International Criminal Court, for the future. Because a failure to properly circumscribe crimes against humanity uh, may, well, will contribute, and I, I agree with him entirely on this, to uh, a lack of focus of the International Criminal Court, uh, an institution with a huge range of reading, 119 territories of the state parties have joined the court, 119 nationalities of the state of the, the nationals of those states outside of those territories, plus whatever territories the court has given jurisdiction, for which the court has given jurisdiction by the Security Council. The prosecutor of the International Criminal Court has literally hundreds of thousands of potential suspects. Um, and if the prosecutor is unable to focus um, we're going to have sheer, not just chaos, but ultimately uh, a sense that justice is entirely arbitrary. The prosecutor picks uh, the situations and the accused that are convenient, sometimes that are the low hanging fruit available to him, and sometimes simply those that suit him and his political outlook. So let me take us back to the origins of the concept of crime against humanity. And, and this is relevant, by the way, as well, not just the litigation about modern day events, right, Ken? But also to some of the ongoing trials and attempts to litigate historic cases of crime against humanity. The Cambodia Tribunal, the Extraordinary Chambers for the Courts of Cambodia, are wrestling with this. They have a decision from last year in the Dort case, but Dort was a guilty plea. Uh, the, are, the issue of whether crimes against humanity could be committed in time of peace uh, during the 1970s was never properly debated and litigated before the court. We have an attempt by Judge Garcon in Spain to initiate investigations into crimes against humanity committed in Spain following the Civil War at time of peace. And again, uh, that issue about the historic meaning of crimes against humanity arises in that litigation. We've had several cases at the European Court of Human Rights dealing with crimes against humanity in the post-Second World War period. Um, generally, 
relating to the obligation of states to investigate those crimes, because the court in most cases, certainly in the Eastern European cases, doesn't have jurisdiction over the crimes themselves because they were committed outside of the temporal scope of the court. So I would think that uh, lawyers who are engaged in international criminal law practice uh, in whatever, from whatever uh, angle um, will find it useful to know about the history of, of crimes against humanity and to be able to invoke the components of that history um, in their in their arguments. And, and like most bodies of law, uh, the arguments can be used from all sides, actually. So whichever side you're on, it behooves you to know a little bit about the, the history of the concept. The the term was first used in a in a legal or in a political sense in 1915 in the famous declaration by Britain, France, and Russia uh, addressed to the Ottoman Emperor em Empire uh, dealing with what today we call the Armenian genocide. The expression used in that statement in May of 1915 was these new crimes of Turkey against humanity and civilization. That's the exact quote. It's not precisely crimes against humanity, but the words are in there, uh, these new crimes of Turkey against humanity and civilization. Research by the late Antonio Cassese in the documents in foreign ministries showed that actually the original term that was used, the, the original draft of that, that message to the Ottoman Empire <coughs> spoke of these new crimes of Turkey against Christianity and civilization. And uh, the states that were issuing the declaration we might think today, for culturally sensitive reasons, decided to change the term to humanity. I'm not sure about that. I think it was actually more a change in the concept, in their understanding of, of what they were charging Turkey with. Because for centuries, the European powers had uh, acknowledged to themselves, and this had also been included in treaties with the Ottoman Empire, an entitlement to intervene in the Ottoman Empire to protect Christian population. This goes as the ancestors of this of, are the Crusades, really, but we have them. They're called the capitulations. They're in various treaties with the Ottoman Empire starting, I think, about the 17th century. And so there was nothing that radical about the suggestion that crimes against humanity, uh, or that they, rather that the European powers could intervene in the Ottoman Empire to protect Christian minorities. When they changed the term to humanity, they were adjusting the paradigm a little bit, it seems to me. Um, although I doubt they had really thought this one through entirely, because if they were saying that Turkey could commit crimes against humanity, then they were also acknowledging that they could commit crimes against humanity as well. Turkey obviously had no acknowledged right to intervene to protect minorities in the British Empire, or in the Russian Empire, or in the French Empire would be interesting to remind the British Foreign Office of this message, you know, a few years ago there was a little flurry of activity in the House of Commons when the Armenian community here in the United Kingdom challenged uh, Britain to condemn, uh, the, first the Foreign Office and then Parliament to condemn the Armenian Genocide. And the Foreign Office issued a, a, a rather pathetic explanation of why they couldn't do that uh, they said that the Genocide Convention had been adopted in 1948 and therefore uh, they couldn't use the term retroactively. And it, it was a pretty feeble explanation. They said it had been based on studies, and I think the Minister stood up in the House of Commons and said as a result of studies we've undertaken, blah, 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 we can't call it genocide. Uh, the Armenians retained uh, Jeff Robertson to uh, do a little report for them, and he uh, initially began with an FOI request. And he said, could I have the studies, please? In terms of, there were no studies. It was just a line that the <laughs> minister had, had been given in the, his answer to the parliamentary question. Uh, well, okay, let's start genocide for a minute. And how about coming back and saying, well, now, would you agree to call them crimes against humanity? Because that's what he called them in 1915. And perhaps you could repeat uh, today in the House of Commons that we charge Turkey with responsibility for crimes against humanity committed in 1915. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Jeff Robinson didn't 
throw that hot potato at them. But I think it would be an interesting uh, angle, and I, I hope the Armenians will, will pursue that one. The term uh, had been spotted, crimes against humanity, prior to 1916 in a, a, couple of, a couple of examples of it being used mainly in a journalistic context. And nobody really knows, knew, at least the literature, reported on no uh, examples of crimes against humanity being used other than by an American journalist in the late 1890s and by a French academic writer, I think, in about 1908. So we have these two sightings, aside from 1915, of the term crimes against humanity, and that's where it's at. Um, I undertook a research project uh, about a year ago <laughs> with my assistant in Galway, where I was, was, was working until this year, to see if, how far back we could trace it. Of course, you know, if you want to trace a word, how it's used, you go to the wonderful 20-volume Oxford English Dictionary, where you can look up crimes and find when that term was used first in the English language, and against, and you can see where that was used in the English language, and humanity. But you can't find crime against humanity because it doesn't do expression. And I didn't know of any reference volume where you could trace these things anywhere no the ones that were found it. We stumbled upon a fascinating new research tool that enables you to uh, discover the use of, of expressions in the English language or in other languages over the centuries. It's called Google Book. <laughs> and we went through Google Book with crime against humanity, crime against humanity, crime contre l'humanité, crime de la humanité, and we used other European languages and, and searched for the, the origins of it. And it turns out that crimes against humanity was actually widely used. Um, we had hundreds, hundreds of hits for crimes against humanity in the 19th century and back into the 18th century. It was frequently used in the 19th century to talk about the slave trade, um, but it was used in other contexts. I found one, my Canadian origins were, were, were pleased to find this, where uh, uh, I think a British politician spoke of the expulsion of the Acadien, the Acadians from Nova Scotia in 1756, was described as, um, as, a, as a, uh, was described subsequently as a crime against humanity. Roger Casement, the Irish patriot, used the term crimes against humanity to talk about atrocities committed against Aboriginal peoples in the Amazon Basin in the late 1890s. The first person to use the expression is almost poetic, Voltaire. So my story, and I'm sticking to it for the time being, is this Voltaire coined the expression crimes against humanity in the 18th century. Of course, it doesn't have a precise, codified legal definition. But the fact that the expression has been used for really hundreds of years before it, it starts being the subject of prosecution in 1945 uh, is, I think, a useful answer to the charge of retroactive prosecution. It shows that the, the, to use the, um, the, the, the uh, concept that the European Court of Human Rights uses in the fine Article 7 of the European Convention, that the law was in some sense uh, accessible uh, and that a, a reasonable person, reasonably informed, would would know of the concept and would know of the content and would know that it was considered to be internationally condemned. Well, the first real prosecution for crimes against humanity, uh, of course, takes place at Nuremberg. And the, the Nuremberg trial is prepared initially through a body called the United Nations War Crimes Commission in, that meets here in London in 1944 and into 1945. Uh, it, it's called the United Nations War Crimes Commission because when it's set up, uh, those who create it, and it's uh, not just composed of the, the great Allied powers, but also some of the smaller powers were involved in the, the Polish and Czech governments in exile, New Zealand, Australia, and so on. Uh, when they set up the United Nations War Crimes Commission, they initially think that it's going to prosecute war crimes. Uh, war crimes in the classic sense. These have been identified um, amongst other sources. They had, they had actually, a list of war crimes was prepared following the First World War in the, when, when prosecutions for war crimes were, were contemplated as a result of, at the Paris Peace Conference. 
and as a result of the Treaty of Versailles. So when they revived this idea of international justice in 1943 through the United Nations of 44, the United Nations War Crimes Commission, the idea was that they would prosecute violations of the laws of customs of war. Battlefield offenses between combatants, abuse of prisoners of war, and certain abuses perpetrated against civilians in occupied territories. And over the course of 1944, the, the debate moves on. And I guess it's a good example of law responding to events, uh, criminal law responding to events as it, as it often does, where we learn of horrible crimes and say, these do not necessarily fit into the law as we know it. We have to respond to it. The, the, one of the features of the international law, of course, is that sometimes we respond to it by bending the rules on non-retroactivity just a little bit. And of course, that's what happened at Nuremberg. There's a, an explanation, which I think many people find to be quite satisfactory, that the rule against retroactive prosecution is the rule of justice and that it would be contrary to justice to let those crimes go unpunished. Well, it's a matter that we're still debating and still arguing about. I don't suppose to address that oral uh, today about the retroactivity of the Nuremberg trial. But what happens in the build-up to the trial is that they, they come to an understanding that they will have to prosecute the Nazis for atrocities perpetrated against their own population that has never been done before uh, as a matter of international law. When it's first proposed in the UN War Crimes Commission, uh, the Foreign Office, the United States Department of State, and others come to the UN War Crimes Commission and say, you can't do that because we don't think international law ever applies to what a state does to its own population. This is off limits. You can deal with the atrocities committed against civilians in an occupied territory. Those are classic war crimes. But you cannot prosecute abuses and atrocities and so on committed by a government against its own people. That's 1944. You can trace the memos there in the history of the UN War Crimes Commission. But, but the debate moves on. And by the end of 1944, there's a growing recognition that it would be necessary because of the atrocities to deal with to deal with them. And they, they use a label in the War Crimes Commission. They talk about atrocities, persecution, and deportation. And then this continues in the, this debate is, is pursued in a second meeting, a second conference that, that takes place here called the London Conference. The London Conference was only the great powers. The smaller countries were excluded. That these were the, the four great powers, the powers that were occupying Germany, the Soviet Union, the United States, France, and the United Kingdom. And they meet here uh, starting in uh, June, late June of 1945, and they finish in early August of 1945, and this is where the Nuremberg trial is prepared. They have a lengthy debate about how to deal with atrocities, persecutions, and deportations. Uh, and uh, there are some very, very striking passages in the record of the conference where the American negotiator, Robert Jackson, who was a justice of the Supreme Court, who was on a, a kind of a lead from the U.S. Supreme Court, first to handle the negotiations, and then later he goes on to be the chief prose prosecutor uh, for the Americans at the Nuremberg trial. And Jackson says, you know, we agree with including the atrocities, persecutions, and deportations conducted by the Nazis against their own people. We agree with including that in the charter of the Nuremberg Tribunal, but subject to an important limitation. And he says, because we, we have in our own country, he's speaking about the United States, examples of the persecution of minorities. And we realize that here, uh, what we're doing is creating law that will apply not just to the Germans, that wouldn't be credible if all we were doing was to create a tribunal that would have a, as a body of law, law that only applied to the Germans. This is law that applies to us as well. And we're not prepared to be held accountable as a matter of international law for 
uh, atrocities committed against our own uh, our own minorities. And, and obviously, he's speaking about the treatment of African Americans in the United States. Uh, Jackson was a liberal Democrat. I'm sure he wasn't proud of the uh, of the uh, conduct in some of the southern states, in particular, uh, towards the American blacks. But he was he was a, he was with Roosevelt's party, and of course, it was it held power in the United States thanks to an alliance with the southern races. So he he was being careful. And uh, I would have loved to have been in that conference room here in London, been a fly on the wall. And uh, to get to, to, to see that, because we don't see from the record the reaction of the the, the French delegate thinking, hmm, that's a good point. And, and what about Indochina and uh, Algeria and Central Africa and so on? And uh, the British delegate thinking, hmm, well, I don't know about minorities in Britain, but how about India, for example, or Aden, or Cyprus, or Nigeria, and so on? And of course, the Russian guy. He's actually a Ukrainian, but maybe he's thinking about some of the, they don't have colonies, but they have a few issues uh, in the Soviet Union. So these are all great powers, all of them with subject peoples, and they're saying, if we prosecute the Nazis for persecuting their civilians, what's going to happen to us? And so they build into the definition of Nuremberg. They say the only reason why these atrocities, persecutions, and deportations committed against subject peoples or minorities in your territory is of interest to international law. And the only reason why you can prosecute it internationally is because of a link with aggressive war. And they build that into the Nuremberg Charter and it's confirmed in the judgment which was issued at the end of September and the beginning of October 1946. In international law we call this the nexus, the nexus with armed conflict. And of course, the, the nexus with armed conflict um, is no longer a part of international uh, criminal law as it stands today. It's clear that it, it has been removed. Uh, we can start tracing it back. We know that it's gone by the 17th of July, 1998, when the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court is adopted, because it's not in the Rome Statute. We know that it's probably not by the time the Yugoslavia tribunal starts to operate, because in the first great judgment of the uh, of the appeals chamber of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, uh, the majority says there's no uh, nexus between crimes against humanity and uh, armed conflict. Although it says it in the statute, actually, the statute of the Yugoslavia tribunal requires that the crime be committed as part of an armed conflict. The judges have found ways of talking around that. They say, well, it was intended to be jurisdictional. It wasn't that not the case. What we know is that the lawyers in the United Nations Secretariat who drafted the Yugoslavia statute in 1993 wanted to take care that their definitions were consistent with customary international law, and they believed that in 1993 to be safely within on the territory of customary international law, you still have to acknowledge the link between crimes against humanity and armed conflict. But the Yugoslavia Tribunal, the Appeals Chamber said it's gone by 1995. <laughs> when is it gone? That's what we don't know. Curiously, in that decision, in 1995, they say the connection between armed conflict and crimes against humanity was peculiar to the Nuremberg trial. That's the word they use, peculiar. And the word peculiar suggests um, suggests an understanding of crimes against humanity that's, that's, that's really rooted in natural law. It's the idea that crimes against humanity as a concept always existed. And then along came Nuremberg and they decided for reasons known only to themselves, or known only to themselves, to impose a jurisdictional limit on the concept, to only deal with crimes against humanity committed in an armed conflict. Why they would have done that, there's no explanation. Why wouldn't we prosecute the Nazis for the atrocities committed before 1939, especially if they were recognized as part of international law at the time? It's all part of whether you view this process and events like the 1915 Declaration, uh, the, the, the London Charter of the International Military Tribunal adopted in 1945, 
the Rome statute, as part of the legis of a lawmaking process, of law being created rather than law always existing. Sometimes they use a, a metaphor drawn from astronomy about the universe. That <laughs> the universe a steady state that we just get to see more of because we build better telescopes, or is it the result of a process of creation of a big of a big bang? And I'm inclined to see it as a dynamic process. And I think this is true of other areas of international criminal law as well, where the law is being created. It's interesting that the decision of the Yugoslavia Tribunal in, in 1995 uses this word peculiar, suggesting this steady state approach to crimes against humanity. The, the presiding judge in that trial was the great Antonio Cassese, who, who died three weeks ago. And uh, curiously, Cassese, in his own journal, uh, the Journal of International Criminal Justice, about three years ago, wrote an article criticizing the judgment of the European Court of Human Rights dealing with crimes against humanity in Estonia in 1949. And he said, the judges of the European Court of Human Rights are not very sophisticated when it comes to international criminal law because they didn't question whether or not crimes against humanity could be committed in peacetime in the 1940s, in the late 40s, because we all know that the connection between armed conflict and crimes against humanity only began to disappear in the late 1960s. So these are you know, different understandings, both of them from Cassese. I regret the fact that I never got to ask him about, about this and, and why, how he explained it. But I suspect that the, what he wrote in the journal article is probably close to the truth. Last week in The Hague at the legacy conference of the International uh, Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. I have breakfast with one of the other judges on the appeals chamber, George, George Abisab, the great uh, uh, Egyptian Swiss um, legal academic. And he had, he had been on this chamber as well. I asked him about the drafting of the judgment. It, incidentally, he told me something interesting. He said, well, I wrote the first part and Nino wrote the second part. And I said, well, what about the legal officers? Because as you all know, these days the judges don't write the judgment at all. They have servants to write them for them. And then they just correct them and they tell them what to do. But they have assistants who write them for them. And I said, you mean you wrote it yourself? And he said, oh yes. And he said, and I don't use a laptop. I still use a pencil and a, pad, a notepad. You know? But this was 1995. Anyway, but he said, we wrote it. Which probably explains why they were able to deliver the judgment within two months of the trial chamber decision, because if they'd given it to the legal officers, it would have taken a year and a half to write. So they wrote this quickly, and I said, what about peculiar? I said, how come you said it was peculiar to Nuremberg? He said, well, we did write it rather quickly, and I don't think we thought those things out, and I think that probably is the case. Well, the question of what they meant at Nuremberg is, is, of course, quite decisive, because this was the way at Nuremberg we distinguish crimes against humanity from ordinary crimes. How do you tell the difference between a murder, period, and a crime against humanity of murder? Well, at Nuremberg it was straightforward. It had to be associated with the aggressive war. At some point between 1945 and 1995, I think it is accurate to say that that nexus disappeared. When Cassese says it starts to disappear in the late 1960s, he's referring to the fact that a few treaties talk about crimes against humanity committed in peacetime. One is the apartheid convention, the other is the treaty on statutory limitations. Neither of them have been widely ratified. I think it's ambitious actually to use those as, it's true there's evidence of an evolution in the thinking, but it's far from convincing that that's the decisive, that those are decisive. Uh, the decision of the Extraordinary Chambers of the Courts of Cambodia of last year says, no, there was no nexus after the Second World War. That's convenient to the judges. They want to retain jurisdiction over crimes against humanity, obviously. It's, it wouldn't be very helpful for them to say, I guess we don't have any jurisdiction over these crimes. We'll have to close the tribunal. We're going to have to pay back three years of salaries. And sorry about that. Okay, judges don't do that, with, as Stephen knows, when you challenge their existence. Um, uh, there, there's no evidence of any warmth towards that idea amongst, amongst judges. But they came up with one of the most facile 
explanations for it. Um, but one that one often sees in the literature, people say, well, it's true that Nuremberg required the connection between armed conflict or aggressive war and the atrocities. But later uh, in the year, in 1945, the Control Council Law, which was the legislation that the Allied occupiers adopted as part of, as, as lawmakers for Germany, not international lawmakers, just legislating for occupied Germany, which had no other government. They said the Control Council Law removed the nexus with armed conflict. And people say, so that shows, you see, an evolution already by the end of, of uh, by the end of 1945, they were doing this. It makes no sense at all. It's, a, it's an argument, I think, that makes no sense at all. It's a, it's, a, it's a trivial argument. Well, here's why. Of course, they're doing something quite different. They're legislating for Germany rather than creating international law. That's very clear from the record of these, these proceedings. And why would these four states insist, for the reasons I've explained, on excluding crimes against humanity in peacetime when they adopt the Nuremberg Charter at the beginning of August 1945, only to throw that away in December of 1945. Why would they do that? Because we understand those arguments without any explanation. And of course, the explanation is simply they were doing something different. They were making laws for occupied Germany rather than creating international law. So it's not a great argument, but many, many people are dissatisfied with this connection between crimes against humanity and armed conflict. I would be too, you can see why. It's a cynical attempt by great powers with subject peoples and colonies and everything to protect themselves. And so there's a growing movement of people saying, well, that's unacceptable, and it does look pretty cynical, and we know why you're doing this. The first manifestation of this is, comes from someone who's attending the London, who attended the London conference, and he's there at the Nuremberg trial when the judgment is delivered. Raphael Lemkin, he's a Polish Jewish uh, uh, lawyer, and Lemkin is the man who, a year and a half earlier, has proposed the word genocide to describe what others would call crimes against humanity. And Lemkin reacts curiously to the Nuremberg judgment and says, it, it, it prosecutes, it condemns genocide committed in wartime, but not genocide committed in peacetime. And he rushes back to New York and begins the process that leads to the adoption of the Genocide Convention, which begins in Article 1 with the words, genocide is a crime that can be committed in time of peace as well as in time of war. And why are those words there? It's to distinguish genocide from crimes against humanity. Well, how am I doing on time? Excellent. Five or ten more minutes? You're doing well. As the as, the, as this debate moves on, a, a body called the International Law Commission, uh, a, a subsidiary body to the General Assembly of the United Nations, starts examining the codification of international crimes uh, when it's created in 1949, and already there's a lot of traction for the idea that we should remove the nexus with armed conflict. The question is, is there anything else that then distinguishes crimes against humanity from ordinary crimes. We have, in a way, two types of crimes within crimes against humanity. We have the crimes against humanity that, that really echo uh, criminal law in the national jurisdiction, murder, rape, and so on. And then we have crimes against humanity that are, that, that are not ordinary crimes. Uh, I'm thinking of the crime against humanity of persecution core concept in crimes against humanity, one of, one of the core key acts. And the, the reason why is because it's very clear that persecution can't be an ordinary crime because it's not committed by individuals. It's committed by the state explicitly through legislation, through acts of uh, legislative acts. At one point, the International Law Commission says, yes, let's remove the next one. And they vote to remove it in 1954. Um, it's a great example when you read the record, you can read the debates of, I don't know if you've ever been at a, at a meeting or some, you know, I guess it's the topic the lawmakers, you adopt the rule one day and then you go home and in the middle of the night you wake up and you're sweating and you're like, oh shit, you forgot something. <laughs> we better go, there's something, no one in the meeting thought of this, but it's a disaster, we better go back and fix it. And that's what happened. So they, 
vote to remove the connection with armed conflict. And they go back a day or two later and someone says, you know, we made a big mistake two days ago. We voted to remove the connection with armed conflict and we didn't replace it with anything. Um, and so finally they decide to replace it with a link to state policy. And that's the version that they adopt in, um, in 1954. Well, we returned to this debate in the 1990s. By the 1990s, as I've said, it's clear from the pronouncements of the Yugoslavia Tribunal that the link with state policy, the, the link with armed conflict has been removed. Crimes against humanity can be committed in peacetime. What about state policy? Um, at, at Nuremberg, this wasn't really debated. If you read the judgment, of Nuremberg, if you read the proceedings, no one stands up and argues and says, well, we have to prove that there was a state policy that led to these atrocities. I mean, it was so obvious at Nuremberg. It just wasn't a matter for debate. None of the Nazi defendants stood up and said, well, I wasn't involved at all in the Nazi apparatus. I mean, it's because they all were. And, and so it was one of those issues that never really got got discussed, although I think there's lots to suggest that it was part of the implied concept of crimes against humanity, um, as prosecuted at Nuremberg and subsequently. What happens at the Yugoslavia Tribunal is, well, some might say it is the syndrome of the low-hanging fruit when they start. They get people like Tadish and, and others who are not <laughs> significant players at all. They're, they're thugs, the kind of people you see hanging around outside railway stations. They're not really important. They're not your Kenya leaders or anything like that. And, and these are the first defendants of the Yugoslavia Tribunal. Um, they, they, they don't have anybody higher up. They haven't yet got the Karadzic and the Mladic's and the Milosevic's and the others, the, the leaders. And so they start prosecuting these people. And of course, their defense lawyers say, but this is, he's just an ordinary guy, really. One of the famous cases that is, uh, that is much beloved in the feminist community was the first big rape prosecution, the Kunarov case. Kunarov, the, the three of them were in charge. They're, they're nasty, misogynist, racist, who abuse women. They do it in peacetime. They do it in wartime. <laughs> That's their job. They're just kind of criminals. That, and, and so they thrive in the, in the oxygen of the conflict in Bosnia and Herzegovina, it gives them, there's less policing, there's more lawlessness, and so they get to do this with a little more freedom than they would in the past. They get brought before the tribunal, and they say, okay, so I, I, I committed rape, so I'm running a brothel, so I'm violent against women. Well, this is crimes against humanity then. I, I'm not involved in the, in the Bosnian, I'm not involved in the state, I'm not doing this stuff, and, and in this, this political struggle. And the judges say, oh, it's not important. We don't need that. It's not a part of crimes against humanity. There's no requirement of a state policy uh, connection. And they issue a famous judgment on this in 2002, the Kunarath Appeals Judgment, where they say, well, there's been some debate before our tribunal, but ultimately um, this is not important. And they have, it's all settled in a footnote, which is a it's a piece of garbage in the footnotes. <laughs> it's just like you were saying, Jill went through. I finally went through every single item in the footnote to trace it. It's just no one ever checked these things. Some, someone gave them a list of stuff and they put it in there. They cite, for example, the 1954 meeting of the International Law Commission as evidence that's where they voted to remove the nexus from crimes against humanity. I told you about this three minutes ago. And so they cite it, but the person who did the research forgot to read the next meeting and the meeting after when they come back and say, that wasn't such a good idea. <laughs> and we better put in the state connection. Uh, and things like that. They cite an Australian judgment. I think it's the only significant Australian judgment in the war crimes field. And they cite that and they say, this judgment proves that one of the post-Second World judgments is no longer recognize this part of customary international law. There's a famous judgment, post-Second World War. It's the one many of you will know because it's the basis of the film, Judgment at Nuremberg. They are the judges. They're, well, they're prosecuting judges and prosecutors. So not only is the state policy of crimes against humanity useful to them, it's fundamental. Because what did those judges and prosecutors do? It's just carry out the policy. So there's a wonderful 
discussion in the judgment about why the policy is so is so central to crimes against humanity. So in the Yugoslavia tribunal, they say, oh, this isn't uh, important, and they cite this Australian case. And I, so I went back and read the Australian case. There's one paragraph, and they don't discuss the issue, but they cite a journal article in support of why that judgment is no good. Um, the judgment dates from 1940. Uh, 47, I think, from December of 47. So I went back and looked for the journal article, and it was published in 1946. <laughs> the one criticizing, allegedly, but of course it doesn't criticize the judgment in 1947 for obvious reasons. In any case, it's a, it's a pretty poor cool effort, finally. And so the worst thing of all, I tell my students, if you ever do this in an assignment, you definitely are going to lose marks, is that they forget to discuss and to address the most important point, which is that four years earlier, 160 states met with Rome and agreed on a definition of crimes against humanity that said that crimes against humanity must be the result of an attack that is pursuant to a state or organization <coughs> plan or policy. And they don't even mention it in the discussion in the Yugoslavia Tribunal. Well, you know, the Yugoslavia Tribunal is coming to an end. There are a few guys in jail probably somewhere who was still saying, I wish my lawyer knew that argument better about the, the and or or simply that that they had had the good fortune to get the big the, the big shots early and just didn't waste their time with these with these low life characters uh, who were prosecuted in the early years of the Yugoslavia tribunal. And so that's what's informing this debate. Uh, this is the Kennedy case. Right? It's the debate about it, it's not about the existence of uh, a policy because the statute requires it. But the judges are divided, and there are those who want to enlarge it. You have the misfortune to have them in the majority. Um, although there's a similar debate that's gone on with the uh, Sudan case, with the uh, arrest warrant of the president of Sudan, where uh, I would say that the majority tipped uh, towards the more rigorous. Approach. This is with regard to genocide rather than crimes against humanity. But there's certainly a very live debate going on, and I'm convinced that the historic argument informs the debate. And and uh, I was I was very pleased to see Judge Judge Powell in his uh, in his defending opinion invoking and his, his references to the historic concept of crimes against humanity. Underlying all of this, and I'll conclude with this point. Well, I, I, I did a seminar a few years ago uh, at, a, at a seminar of judges of the Yugoslavia Tribunal, and we talked about these differences. And I said, you know, you're really, you, the law you're applying is quite different from the law that they're applying at the International Criminal Court. And, and it does boil down to this policy element. And I said, you know, it's the wrong statute. It was pretty clear in 1998 that the policy is there. And one of the judges at the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia said, well, he, he, who had been there, by the way, because several of them had been diplomats or consultants, and he'd been at the Rome Conference, and he said, well, well yes, but I remember we put, but we, we didn't just say state policy, we said state or organizational policy. And he said, and we put the word organizational in there so that they cover the terrorists. That's what we want to cover. And uh, this is a syndrome that we do see in the discussions about, even at the judicial level, about the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. There were many people who were there at the conference, including myself, and we all loved saying what we meant was. Okay. What, it's not part of the record. There's no, there's no document to suggest what we meant. There's a very slim record, and most of the debates are not recorded, quite intentionally, so that there would be free and open discussion. But there are still there are judges sitting there on the bench at the, in, in the Hague, applying their own statute, who think they know what we meant. And of course, they may have meant one thing. It's like all legislative bodies; they they think they meant one thing, and someone else thinks they meant something else. The Americans and the Brits think they meant something when they were adopting it, but the Russians and the Chinese, who were also there at the negotiations, think they meant something else. But I do think that at the bottom of it, I mean, when we present the arguments about state or organizational policy. They go, well, what kind of an organization is it? Is it would that include the 
the law society of uh, London or whatever, or the student box, or the Hell's Angels, or the Mafia, or does the organization, and if there's some implied content that suggests the organization should be an organization that is state-like, is it, in other words, is it either part of the state, like the Gestapo or the SS, the Ubiquitin Store, for example, or is it a body that, without being a state, <coughs> behave like a state, like the FARC in Colombia or the, or the Palestinian Authority or, or the Republic of Serbska, an entity or something like this. And so this is the, this is the, this is the case, and I hope that the history is, is useful and that they get it right. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.